Welcome to the Prolific Author Podcast. Let's face it, readers read fiction to feel emotion and be transported and transformed. In this ongoing digital revolution, where online marketing is always in flux, the only way to create a sustainable author business and live off your royalties is to write transformational stories, market at every stage of the author journey, and cultivate a loyal audience of readers. Fortunately, there's never been more opportunity to make a living as a fiction author. Hi, I'm Liesl Hill, USA Today bestselling author and story clarity coach. When I'm not dictating my own stories about dragons, serial killers, and dystopian worlds, I help other authors write their own transformational fiction, position them as bestsellers, and market them like pros. Join me on the podcast where I give writing tips, marketing how-tos, story advice, and interviews with other authors who are in the trenches just like you and making it work. We are prolific authors. Hi there. Welcome back to the Prolific Author Podcast. Liesl here as always. And today I'm going to deconstruct a movie for you. Um, this is something that I have been getting a lot of requests for. I've had probably four people in the last month tell me that I need to do more of these and hey, I'm happy to do it. <laughs> so this is me giving you guys what you want. Um, I've always been really good at deconstructing stories. So of course, texts of different kinds and books, but I also am happy to analyze movies and TV shows. Um, as you, a lot of you know, I'm a big Walking Dead fan, and that's part of what I do in the fandom, is analyze the symbolism and where the storyline might be going. But I've also analyzed poetry and song lyrics and things like that, so I guess it doesn't really matter what the medium is. I just love analyzing stories. I'm a total geek about it, and it's what I love to do. So that's what I'm going to do for you today. And I kind of just arbitrarily picked um, Pirates of the Caribbean. The first film is the one I'm going to focus on. So it's The Curse of the Black Pearl. Now, just a little bit of background on this particular movie. I remember going to see it in the movie theaters. And um, I think I probably did because Orlando Bloom was in it and I was a big Lord of the Rings fan. But I found that I really, really loved it. There was just something about it that was really compelling and really fun. And, you know, I certainly wasn't the only one. This was a franchise that went billion dollar franchise and really, really took off. And there's good reason for that. I didn't enjoy the second and third movie quite as much as the first. I, I still thought that they were good movies, but the first one, they just did such a good job with the story and the characters and the character arcs. And that's why I'm going to analyze it for you today. So we will get to that in just a minute. On a personal update, um, I am still working on my academy. The actual content of it is done, but I'm working on getting some, you know, technical things in place so that I can guide people into it very smoothly. So that's all tech stuff that I have to do on the back end, and it's not very fun, but I'm getting through it very slowly. So I'm hoping in the next week or two to have everything in place, and then I can open the doors to it again. And I may actually have some free training for you guys, so stay tuned for that. In terms of my writing, I am trying to finish up my Intercron series, like really finish it up. I've been trying to finish it up, you know, quote unquote, trying to finish it up all year, but it's kind of taken a backseat to getting my academy put together. Um, so I'm really close to getting it finished, and I don't know that I'll get both books out before the end of the year, probably more like in January, but... The thing is, I'm also really close to finishing the first book of Dragon Magic. So what's going to end up happening <laughs> is that I'm going to end up putting out like three books over the next two or three months because I'm so close to finishing all of them. But what I've decided to do is to try and finish up Intercron during NaNoWriMo, which is next month. It's coming up. So I'm probably going to end up doing some sort of mini NaNoWriMo kind of thing in my Facebook group. I'm not sure exactly what it'll be yet. Like maybe I'll do... Um, you know, daily word count posts or something like that. So if anybody wants to follow along with me on that and is planning to do NaNoWriMo, just make sure and join my free Facebook group uh, before November 1st. It is called The Prolific Author, and all you have to do is search on Facebook for The Prolific Author group, and it should pop right up. Okay, so that should be fun. I actually usually don't do NaNoWriMo, at least not very um, intentionally, because Either I don't do it at all, or I'm already writing enough that I'm fulfilling that anyway, so it's just not that big a deal for me, but I'm definitely going to kind of focus on it this year because I want to kind of do a thing, like I said, in my Facebook group and have lots of people participate, hopefully, but also because I'm trying to finish this series, so I'm kind of just using that as a goal, as a deadline to get this done because I swore I would get it done by the end of the year, and what do you know? <laughs> it's November, and I'm almost done, so this is the perfect opportunity. So I will be doing that if anybody wants to follow along. Once again, just search the Prolific Author group on Facebook. Okay, so let's get to the deconstruction of Pirates of the Caribbean, Curse of the Black Pearl. 
So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to use the nine plot points and we're going to deconstruct the plot so that you can see which parts of the story correspond with which of the nine plot points. I do have a PDF of the nine plot points. If you need a reminder, you can download it to your computer and use it as a quick reference anytime you need it. And I will put the link to that in the show notes for anyone who wants to get it. So let's just go over the nine plot points quickly and then we will hop into the story. I still do refer to them as the nine plot points, though I've kind of expanded them to be 10. So obviously I need to change that, but um, yeah, I haven't done it yet. <laughs> so the nine or 10 plot points are these. We have the world before, which just represents the world of the story, how the characters are kind of the status quo before the conflict hits. Then we have the intro of the conflict. The intro of the conflict is when something new is kind of introduced to the world or to the story, but it's important to know that, that it doesn't cause the characters to take action. This is just their first introduction to it, but for the most part, their lives go on as they always have. Then we have the call to adventure or the CTA. Now this is different than the intro because this is something that actually causes them to take action, to go on an adventure, you know, that changes their world in some way and that they have to take action about. So that's why it, that is the call to adventure. Um, then we have the escalation. This is what it sounds like, just um, something that increases the tension, that increases the conflict, that makes it more difficult for the characters. And I only mention one escalation here and one escalation in the second heart part of the story. At least that's what it is for the nine or 10 plot points. But it's important to know that you could have many escalations. You need to have at least one to make sure that the story doesn't get bogged down, but most stories have many. And I'll, I'll kind of um, illustrate that as we get into uh, Pirates of the Caribbean. The next plot point is the midpoint. This is usually something that takes the characters from a state of reaction to action. So up until this point, they've probably just been reacting to whatever's happening to them, kind of being carried along by the tide of it. But this is where they actually make a plan and do something very um, purposeful to try and solve the problem. But the midpoint can also be anything that causes sort of the, the tide of the story to change. They get new information or um, they realize something and that sort of changes their focus in a way. But like I said, very often we have them going from reaction to action and that is the way in which their focus has changed. Um, then in the second part of the story, we need a second escalation, as I said before. Um, this really needs to be bigger than the first escalation. So this is where we often get um, tragic deaths or major battles or, um, you know, just it's got to be a big deal, a second escalation. And then we come to the climax, which of course is the showdown between the protagonist and the antagonist, the good guy and the villain, you know, whatever it is that is going on in your story. Um, during this climax, we're going to have a moment of uber despair. This is often called dark night of the soul. This is the all is lost moment where they think they're going to fail. The bad guy's going to win. Someone's going to die, that sort of thing. But then we come to the aha moment, and that is where they realize what they need to do in order to be victorious. So they have this moment where they are basically saved and the uber despair does not happen to them. And then of course the resolution. The resolution is how the story ends, um, however that may be. So you don't have to resolve all plot lines, especially if we're talking about one book in a series, but you have to come to a moment of resolution for this installment at the very least. And if it's a standalone and there's not going to be any more story, then you do need to resolve most major plot threads. Okay, so let's see how this works out for Pirates of the Caribbean. So we have the world before. What is going on with the characters before the conflict hits? Well, they're all missing something, and that's the way it should be with your character in the beginning. They're missing something that will lead to their happiness in some way. So the three major characters that we have in this movie, let's just go over them so that we're all on the same page. We have Will Turner, who is played by Orlando Bloom, uh, Elizabeth Swan, who is played by Kira Knightley, and of course, Jack Sparrow, who is played by Johnny Depp. And then of course, maybe we should also mention that we have uh, the villain is Captain Barbosa, who is played by Jeffrey Rush, okay? So um, for our three main characters, the thing that they're missing that will make them happy. For Will and Elizabeth, it's pretty much unrequited love. I mean, it's very clear from the beginning that these two are being set up as love interests. Um, for Jack, it's the fact that he doesn't have his ship, right? We don't really know that right away, but as it turns out, he is a captain without a ship and he has had some very unjust things happen to him in the past and that all needs to be made right. Okay, so then we get to the intro. 
The intro that I've identified is when Elizabeth falls into the ocean wearing the medallion. Now, why is that the intro? Because something happens when she falls into the ocean. Um, the, you know, the, the pearl or the, the medallion reacts with the ocean water and we see sort of this wave of magic flow out from it. Okay, so something happened there, but we, the audience, don't know what it is. We don't know the significance of that and, and neither do the characters. They don't even realize anything has happened. Okay, so this really qualifies as something happened, something changed because she had that medallion for years and was just keeping it. But that morning she was wearing it and fell into the water. Okay, so that made it so that there was something different that had not happened any other morning, but it doesn't cause the characters to take action in a big way. I mean, of course they go rescue Elizabeth from the water and everything, but I mean, on a grander scale, you know, they put Jack Sparrow as a pirate in prison. They go back to their lives. For the most part, the status quo remains the same. So the call to adventure comes when the crew of the Black Pearl shows up at their um, port and attacks them and kidnaps Elizabeth. Now, that is the call to adventure because it causes Will and, you know, he goes and gets Jack to help him to go on this adventure to rescue Elizabeth. That's what they're trying to do, but it also makes them learn about what actually is going on here. Okay, so that's the call to adventure. That's what makes them actually take action. And of course, it changes the status quo, whereas before nothing seemed to have really changed for them. When the medallion went into the water, this changes everything and gets everybody all, you know, into action and moving to try and fix things. So then we have to have an escalation in the first part of the show. Now, again, there can be many of these. Um, the one that I identified is Elizabeth learning about the curse. Okay, so this is an escalation because it goes from just your average everyday pirates who, you know, already she thinks she's in trouble. She's probably going to get killed. They've kidnapped her. You know, she's not in a good situation. But then she learns that these aren't even actually regular pirates. These are um, undead, you know, kind of zombified pirates and they're cursed and they can't be killed. Okay, so that's definitely an escalation. But you could identify other escalations like um, Will learning that his father was a pirate that Jack knew. That's an escalation for him because that causes internal turmoil. We have the two of them stealing a ship. Okay, that's kind of an escalation. I mean, it's not a bad one, but it still is kind of a, a wrinkle because now they have um, the Royal Navy after them for stealing the ship and he will has become kind of an outlaw in his own right, right? So there's, there's a lot of things that could be escalations, but for the overall story, I think learning the truth of the curse was kind of the biggest one. Okay, then we reach the midpoint. The midpoint, I think, is when they, Captain Barbosa gets to the cave where the treasure is with Elizabeth the first time. And he, you know, cuts her hand so that he can get her blood and tries to lift the curse. Now, why is this the midpoint? Because this is where things change. Up until this point, because she gave them her name as being Turner, which was a lie, they thought that it was her blood they needed to break the curse. So they were uh, laboring under a misconception. And at this point, they kind of have to change gears because they learn that her blood is not the one they needed, right? And so that changes everything. They basically have to pivot and reformulate their plan. In terms of Will and Elizabeth, Will does succeed in rescuing Elizabeth at this point and taking her on a ship back, you know, toward home. So that's a little bit of a different thing for them too. They're at least Captain Barbosa isn't in control and calling the shots anymore. They've kind of taken back control a little bit of uh, <laughs> what's going on and are trying to move forward from there. Okay, so then we need to have a second escalation in the second part of the story, and it needs to be bigger than the escalation in the first part of the story, right? Um, for this, I would say that it is the big battle between the ships, okay? So this is a huge battle. It's super fun. It's really, really well done. But this really does qualify as an escalation. There's a lot going on here. People are trying to kill each other. There's fighting. There's cannons going off. There's boats slamming into each other. You know, all kinds of things happening. And um, within it, you could actually find a lot of smaller escalations. So one of them is actually just before the battle when Will and Elizabeth talk and she gives him the medallion. This is kind of an escalation because it kind of ups the tension in their romance a bit, but it's also Will still trying to come to terms with who his father was. But then we get the actual battle. Um, you know, we've got Jack fighting his own battles against Barbosa and all kinds of escalations there with him not doing so well. <laughs> and then we have Will who gets trapped in the underneath, you know, cargo part of the ship and he can't get out and it's filling up with water. Now, anyone who's in my academy, I teach both the internal and the external character arcs in a lot more detail. And one of the things we talk about is that at some point there should be a mini death and rebirth for the character. 
Now, that's what this is for Will. It seems that he has died. And, you know, it's true that most viewers or readers at this point probably aren't going to really believe that he's dead because he's the main character and we're just a little more than halfway through the story. Most most readers are going to know that he's not actually going to die right there. But he doesn't know that. And the other characters in the story don't know that. And they really think that he has died. And so this definitely counts as a death and mini rebirth, which is definitely an escalation. Okay, that was a crazy time for all of them. Um, all right. So the, again, the, the second escalation was the boat battle. Then we get to the climactic moment which of course is a showdown between good and evil. Now, this is actually a pretty complicated story and, and you know, maybe I should have led with that at the beginning, but it's it's just interesting because it's a Disney movie, it's very family friendly, it's very fun, and it's actually very complicated, the plot that they've put together because they have all these different characters and all of them have their own individual arcs, but then they, those arcs also, of course, do weave together into this overall story that is happening. And I think that's part of why it was so successful because they did this so well, so seamlessly, and yet it's very fleshed out and it's very, we can follow all of their arcs and all of them have really dynamic arcs that end in catharsis. And it's just, it's just a really, really well told story. But it is complicated. It's not simple. So when we get to the climax here, there are actually different climactic moments for each of the characters, and they don't happen all at the same time. They're somewhat staggered, which is perfectly okay. In fact, I think the best stories are told that way. Okay, so when it comes to the final battle and the showdown between good and evil, each of them have their own, like I said. So we're going to have Jack versus Barbosa. They are the ones that are kind of pitted against each other. They're one another's foils, right? Because Barbosa was the one who betrayed Jack and took his ship. And of course, there are two pirates and two captains, so they, they match up well together. Um, with Will and Elizabeth, it's a little bit less obvious here. They're just kind of fighting their own battles and doing their own things in different places. We have Barbosa trying to kill Will to spill his blood and lift the curse. Okay, we also have him trying to figure out what Jack is doing because Jack clearly has a plan and, you know, Will is just trying to follow it and, and try to, you know, make it work. Elizabeth is running around trying to save Will and also stay alive and, again, just trying to, you know, get everything to come together in a way that will work amidst all the chaos and the fighting. We even have some smaller climactic moments um, over on the ship with Elizabeth's father and the Commodore, who I haven't talked about too much because they're, they're more um, side characters and don't have massive arcs, but that's going on during this uh, climactic battle as well. So we have to have the uber despair moment, okay? And this is where things get a little bit staggered. For Will, his uber despair moment comes when he is almost killed. So this actually comes right before all the battling begins. They actually have him bent over, you know, the chest of gold and are about to cut his throat. So that's his moment of uber despair because it really looks like Will is about to die. Um, his aha moment comes when Jack suddenly shows up and stops them. And this is very literally an aha moment because Barbosa had marooned Jack on the island and couldn't figure out how he was alive and how he'd gotten back, right? But now they know he's there and um, this manages to save Will from death. Elizabeth's uber despair moment comes right at the end and hers is pretty close to synonymous with Jack's. We come to a point where she's running around, but Barbosa aims a gun at her and she kind of stops short because she realizes he's she's in his crosshairs and he's about to shoot her. Um, so that is her uber despair moment because she almost dies right there. But the aha moment comes because just then Jack shoots Barbosa and it just kind of distracts him so he doesn't end up shooting Elizabeth. But Jack's moment is kind of the most important here. He actually kind of has two uber despair and aha moments and they're both equally important to the plot. The first is when he is actually stabbed and it looks like Jack just got killed. But then he sort of staggers backwards and that's when we realize that he actually took some of the gold and therefore is under the curse as well. So the aha moment is that he didn't actually get killed. He, like all the other pirates who have taken the gold, is kind of undead and couldn't be killed by that sword at that point because he was, you know, one of the undead. So that was the first uber despair and aha for him. The second comes when he actually shoots Barbosa. Now this does save Elizabeth from getting killed, but more than that, Barbosa looks down and says, you know, you kept that shot for 10 years and then you just wasted it because I can't be killed. So that's kind of a mini despair. Like maybe he didn't, you know, he didn't quite do the Inigo Montoya and get his revenge as much as, you know, we would have liked. But then we realized that just at that moment, Will had cut his own hand, spilling his blood and put that last coin that Jack had taken back into the treasure chest, which meant that it broke the curse. So the aha moment is that Jack didn't waste anything. He waited for that opportune moment, which is what he had told Will earlier, 
that shot actually did kill Barbosa. Barbosa just didn't realize it yet because he didn't realize the curse had been lifted, okay? And of course, that leads to the ultimate victory because it's victory over Barbosa, over the curse, and over the pirates at large because they are now human, can be killed, and all of them just throw down their weapons because now they, they know that they are not invincible anymore. So, how does the film end? This is the resolution. Remember that I said at the beginning that they were all missing something that they needed for happiness. For Will and Elizabeth, it was the unrequited love because they weren't together. Um, with Jack, he didn't have a ship and a crew, and because he's a captain, that's what he needs to be happy. So how does this end? We do have one more kind of fun little sequence where they try to kill Jack, and Will intervenes, and so does Elizabeth. Um, but in the end, we have Will and Elizabeth together. We see them kiss, and, you know, the romance kicks off. And, of course, Jack gets away. He's not a prisoner anymore. He doesn't get killed, and he gets his ship and his crew back. So that's really intentional. Whatever is going on in the world before, whatever they are missing, by the end, they should obtain it. Okay, that brings the story full circle, and we see that what they were missing, they now possess. And that's what really creates a very, very satisfying story. Also, you know, you could go a little bit into the internal, which I'm going to just briefly. We need to look at what changed for them internally. And I'm not going to go through all of the steps. I teach this step by step in the academy. I'm just going to kind of more go over the general arcs here. For Will and Elizabeth, of course, there's the romance between them. You know, that they, they do develop the romance very well. I even teach um, the eight steps of romance progression, okay, that you need to make sure you have in order to have a well-developed romance and so that people can just see it kind of organically developing over the um, course of the story, and they do that very well here. But the other thing is that the way in which their beliefs change, it has to do with believing Jack and pirates at large can actually be good people. So at the beginning, both Will and Elizabeth spend a lot of time yelling at Jack, telling him he's a scoundrel, he's a criminal, you know what I mean? And, and it doesn't bother him that much. He, he can very much owns who he is, but they don't like him because he's living outside the law, you know, and Will doesn't believe that his father would have been um, a pirate. So they have to both get to the point where they believe that. And at the end, we go from them not liking him and very much being behind the decision to throw him into prison um, to, at the end, both of them actually standing between him and death and defending him. And Will even calls him a good man. And so we see that their beliefs about this have changed. And that is the way that their dynamic character arc kind of proceeds. Um, for Jack, it's it's a lot more subtle. He doesn't change that much from beginning to end. He is who he is, and that's not going to change greatly. But I think part of it is doing the right thing and putting himself on the line, um, specifically for Will, okay? Because at the beginning, we very much see that he's just all about himself. He doesn't do anything that doesn't benefit him. <laughs> what is his funny little uh, little motto? It's something like, take what you want, give nothing back, right? The pirates say that. But then we do see him you know, put himself on the line for Will and not get too upset about it, not get too judgmental about the fact that his crew left him behind and he's probably going to be hung for that. You know, he just kind of goes, well, you know, it is what it is. So I think we, we do see him change a little bit and become more giving of himself and less selfish, even if that's only by small degrees. You know, it's not like a huge, massive change in perspective or anything, but we do get that a little bit. Okay. So that's the internal. We went through um, the nine plot points, which is about the plot or the external and the internal. In terms of theme, for themes, I just look at things that are repeated over and over again. They can be repeated in dialogue or in situation. So leverage is a big one. They, they focus a lot on needing leverage in order to be able to bargain and get what you want. Another way in which they show leverage is, for example, when Will is breaking Jack out of his cell. They, can't, they don't have the keys, so he has to find some way to get him out without the keys, and Jack just says, that he built the cells, he kind of knows the engineering of them, and he says all we need is some leverage. So again, they're just using the word leverage in different ways and kind of illustrating it as a theme. Bargains are a big one, and that happens both situationally and in dialogue. Situationally, they're always trying to bargain with the pirates to get what they want, but I noticed that even in the dialogue, um, they'll just use that word a lot. Elizabeth says it a couple of times. Well, what about our bargain? And they didn't have to use that particular word. They could have had her worded a different way, but it's part of the theme. So they did that purposely. Um, there's also a lot of emphasis on rules and loyalty. Um, they talk about the pirate code a lot. So that's a big theme. Okay. I think that's all I have for Pirates of the Caribbean. I hope that helped you understand how the story was put together. And what's really important is how successful this show ended up being. Um, I remember hearing a funny story once, I think Kira Knightley told it, about how they, even the actors, didn't know how it would go over. It's such a quirky, kind of different 
sort of show and they kind of wondered if it would ruin all of their careers. <laughs> so she told a story about the three of them, her and Orlando Bloom and Johnny Depp, sitting in the theater at the premiere and just sort of holding hands as the lights went down and going, okay, here we go. Let's hope we didn't just kill our careers, you know? And the opposite happened, you know? It became this huge worldwide phenomenon. But I guarantee the reason for that, it's not because of any of the actors that were in it. It's not for any reason other than that it was a really well-told story. I mean, it was fun, but you also had a very compelling romance and, um, you know, lots of cool, yeah, sure, cool action scenes with, with the boat battles and all the sword fighting and everything. And it was genuinely funny. You know, I mean, we all know that Johnny Depp is hilarious in it. And, and even the other pirates, I mean, I love Jeffrey Rush in it. I think he had so much fun playing a pirate. So it, it, it was a lot of things that came together. But if they had not had a very well-told story, very well-rounded characters with dynamic arcs, the kind of story that follows a pattern that audiences automatically connect with, that human beings are sort of engineered to absorb in the way it was told, it would not have been that successful a franchise, okay? Like I said, it was just a really well put together story. It hit all of the relevant points and what do you know? It became a billion dollar franchise, okay? So that's really important to remember. This is the stuff that you need to be able to put into your stories to get people to connect with it in the way they connected with this so popular franchise. So many of us writers think that we don't need writing craft. We think we know how to write a story. And it's not that we don't, we definitely have usually good bones and we are better at telling stories than maybe other people are because we have a natural flair for it. But that doesn't mean that we don't need story craft. Just because someone takes a lot of anatomy and physiology classes in high school doesn't mean they don't need medical school before they become a doctor, okay? They may know more about it than most people, but they still need to learn their craft, okay? That's true of every craft and every job and market out there, okay? So this is why we need to learn this stuff. We can write stories without it and it doesn't hurt anyone, so that's why it's a little bit different than trying to do surgery on someone without learning how. But our stories are not going to be terribly successful unless we know our craft, unless we know how to help our audience connect with them automatically. And only then will we see the kind of success that Pirates of the Caribbean saw, okay? So I hope this was helpful to you. I hope it um, enlightened you in some way and got you excited about putting the nine plot points into your own story, you know, whatever you're working on, your work in progress. And hey, maybe you can go put those into your story and then be ready to get everything written for NaNoWriMo. I hope you join me in the Facebook group, the Prolific Author Facebook group. All right, so that's what I have for today. Go forth and write amazing stories. And remember, there is always a market for awesome. See you guys next week me again. Before you go, if you found value in this episode, I would love it if you could leave me a review. Reviews are the best way to show your appreciation and help others find this podcast. Be sure to screenshot it, share it on your favorite social media network, and tag me at LK Hill Books. Remember, the world needs your stories. Only you can change someone's heart with your fire-breathing dragons, your mind-blowing mysteries, your epic romances, and your intense thrillers. So join the revolution and be a prolific author.